welcome, uh, friends. I'm really, really grateful for each of you to uh, join me here today. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to just start off with is uh, how has it been as an artist, uh, as well as like uh, creative entrepreneurs, as well as um, people who are putting themselves out there, uh, how has it been in the last like year and a half, two years uh, throughout uh, COVID, and um, how has that affected your mental health and your connection with art? So whoever would like to start, uh, you're welcome to share. I'll start since I had the, uh, the shortest bio. <laughs> um, uh, the pandemic was made for me. Like I just, uh, I love being home. I, I live here in Mississauga, have for 30 something years. And, uh, but I also have a little place, uh, um, I'm not allowed to call it a cottage because my husband says people will think it's nice. Um, it's like a, this little off the grid cabin in the woods and that's where the bees are. And so um, when I started like teaching and doing a lot of things online in 2014 due to uh, a lot of anxieties and uh, some depression and still needing to pay the cell phone bill, I turned a lot of what I did outside inside so I did a lot of stuff online so when the pandemic came I was fine like uh, that that was uh, I was actually busier than ever type of thing because I already had um, an online presence teaching art and doing art um, something though that I do want to to uh, address right off the bat um, for border crossings is uh, a lot of us have you know our, our border crossing stories and and one thing that um, happened to my family is my 27 year old daughter passed away at the beginning of this year actually January 1st of all like days type of thing and so that was a, a huge um, I guess border crossing type of event that happened to our life we saw it coming she uh, was born with heart problems and had a heart transplant in May 2019 um, and I know that this is a, this is a, a, a panel to talk about uh, mental health and she had issues, I have issues, my whole family type of thing and we've never been shy to talk about it. So, um, but one thing that I wanted to say about uh, how the pandemic uh, affected us and affected us uh, creatively is that uh, a lot of what I did was already for family and because of family. And now that uh, my daughter Emily has passed, it's made it even more so. So um, the pandemic is sort of, it, it, we, because of her um, autoimmune disorders and things like that, I, we washed our hands and wore masks all the time anyway. So it was, the pandemic meant nothing really to us type of thing other than she passed away, not of COVID, but she, she, that's what I tell people. She didn't, she didn't die of COVID, but she did die because of COVID. And um, yeah, that's something that I, I'm deal working with now, like working through now. Sure, yeah, it was challenging and stressful and rewarding and inspiring and it's, it's interesting now and it's actually joyous to be in a room with all of you. This is actually really, really nice. <laughs> um, I actually released an album three months before the pandemic. Great timing. <laughs> so I was originally planning to be on tour for most of, uh, of 2020. I was scheduled to be out in BC at a conference in April. I had a bunch of shows. I do a, a lot of the Irish music as well. So I had everything I had was 
back-to-back -back shows all around St. Patrick's Day. I had a bunch of performing arts centers that had booked me. Um, I was going to be doing na some national touring and potentially going down to the States in the fall. Nope. That all clearly went by the wayside. Um, and as somebody who makes a great deal of their living from live performance, uh, being cut off overnight, uh, it was one of those things that I do consider myself far more fortunate than most of my colleagues because I'm also an educator, which meant that I had a small student base to begin with, so I was able to pivot into doing a lot of virtual teaching. I also teach seven disciplines, so it's not like I have one, it's not like I play bassoon or something where it's a very limited number of students. I play, you know, uh, I'm a, I'm a multi-instrumentalist and I, and I teach uh, that in theory and songwriting, so I had an ability to recreate income, which a lot of my colleagues didn't have. I remember I did my first um, recording session during COVID in June of 2020 when we were first being allowed to start doing things again and I had a cellist come in to play with us. And she said, this is the first thing I've done since this started. Because she's a hired gun, she'll play with like, she played with Lights and Frank Sinatra Jr. Basically, you know, if someone needs a heavy hitter cellist, she gets the call. There were no calls to be had. Um, so one of the things that I did pretty early on that made a big difference for me was, um, I do a lot of um, community music programming in Mississauga. I've hosted a series of open mics in the city for about 10 years, and I decided that, okay, well, if I can't do this in person, I'm gonna make a virtual one. So one of the things that helped me a lot when this first started and helped, you know, kind of get my, my head level was service. Um, I started something called the Together at Home open mic, and it was a weekly event I did on Zoom that broadcast to Facebook, and I did it basically every week for a year and a half. Um, up until probably September, um, minus you know scheduling conflicts and, and what have you. Um, so that that actually helped me a lot. It, it kept me in touch with the local local musicians in the community. Uh, it allowed me to share some of the knowledge that I was learning about how to put on a quality virtual performance using the best technology that we had. Um, because I was doing that, and people saw that it brought me other opportunities. Uh, I ended up becoming a content creator for the Guitar Shop Canada based in Port Credit, so I do their edutainment. <laughs> um, and I, from a mental health perspective, I mean, I, it, it was stressful. I mean, you, when you have your livelihood completely wiped away, uh, and, and the thing is, I had, this, this was one of the things that was, was difficult for me because a lot of, I fall as under the gig worker category, so at first we didn't know if there was going to be any assistance. And then when we did, I didn't qualify. So I basically said, okay, this is a sink or swim situation. I better figure it out. And I'm, I'm grateful because I was able to, and it looks like 2021 from as things have ramped back open has been a wonderful year for me. I've been able to, I had to stop a bunch of work <laughs> because I took on too much, which is a whole other mental health thing that we can talk about, the whole scarcity mentality that you end up taking on way more than you should because you're worried about what you can, what you're gonna lose because you have no idea what the next day is gonna hold during this. But um, I've learned a lot, both about myself and my relationship with my partner. Um, I have I picked up a whole bunch of new skills I didn't have, which was very useful, and I'm sure will be very useful for me going forward. And uh, I'm hopeful. So, thanks. Sweet. Thank you so much, Matt. That was that was amazing to be able to hear that, and also like the process of the challenges, but also like where you're able to like step forward and be able to. Um, Thank you so much, Sandra, Matt, for sharing your personal stories. I wanted to share with you a little bit about my story and how I came to the Border Crossings Project, the Art Gallery of Mississauga. If um, those of you who are out in the audience today know me, um, mental health uh, consulting in the area of mental health and diversity, equity and inclusion is very close to my heart. And uh, it's been basically my life's work over the past 
two years, especially since the George Floyd incident. Um, anyone who's anyone within consulting and uh, equity, diversity, inclusion has been working overtime over the past couple of years, mm -hmm. just looking towards creating strategies um, to bring awareness towards black mental health and, and uh, mental health affecting marginalized communities. But I wanted to share a little bit more about my story, get a little bit more vulnerable and, and sort, of, sort of tell you a little bit why about, a, a little bit about why I'm interested and why this is so close to my heart, talking about mental health, using art as a tool, as a strategy to teach mental health skills and coping mechanisms. Actually, um, my experience over the pandemic has been um, quite a challenging one. There's um, something that many of you don't know about me. Uh, over the past five years, I had been um, fighting a very challenging si silent battle, um, which has actually led to my <laughs> political uprising this year and running for, <laughs> running for MP in the 44th general election and um, sort of has taken a lot of my platform with me. But um, the pandemic actually exacerbated um, a bipolar diagnosis that I had uh, landed five years ago. Um, you know, and uh, I found myself actually hospitalized for the entire month of February last year. And so uh, for those of you who are looking for me in February last year, I was nowhere to be found because I was locked up in the hospital. <laughs> But um, that experience in and of itself was so critical, so key in my, my own healing journey because that's where I really started to put two and two together and start looking at the tools I had in front of me in order to promote my own healing, my own wellness and, and to, to bring those same tools to people who share similar situations, similar life stories. And it wasn't until I took Let's see, I had, when I was in the hospital, I had nothing to read but a book on art, on West African art, and a dialectical skills, uh, dialectical behavioral skills <laughs> therapy book. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to put two, to, two and two together and see if I can help folks just like myself and then also help folks within my community. And that sort of led to my, my, my mission in, in terms of um, creating therapeutic educational tools for the black community and teaching um, emotional regulation skills. And sort of that's been my journey journey and uh, has led to my political uprising um, in teaching, um, teaching mental health skills to help um, people transform, to help people overcome ad adversity regardless of what that is, what that diagnosis is, um, and what that situation or context is. And, since that experience, actually, um, and you know, I'm still riding. I'm still riding the election high after that. And you know, it, campaigns don't end immediately after the ballots have been cast. Um, there's still a lot of wrap up and debriefing to do, and um, you know, still riding the high of that. But in my experience, I've had such a wonderful opportunity to speak to the issues. Um, concerning people who are in marginalized communities, specifically those in the black community and the indigenous community, and how the events of the past two years have really exacerbated our mental health challenges um, that have arisen from just systemic racism, uh, systemic oppression, and um, my business has been booming. I can't say <laughs> any more than that, but, you know, because so many people want to learn more about how we can use tools that are indigenized. How can, how can we use tools that are decolonized to tease out and deconstruct all of those things that have um, led to those situations of internalized racism, internalized systems of oppression, and then work towards our own healing. And so that's sort of what I've been working on towards, uh, working towards in the past year. And it's led me to some wonderful places um, including teaching with the Border Crossings Project. Um, I ended up developing um, a program called Visions of Wellness, and that was actually a program I developed immediately after I was discharged from the hospital um, using tools that I had learned, and I wanted to give it to the community um, through um, in, a, in an accessible way, using artistic practice um, so that um, you know, th the lessons could be embodied. Um, in, in those who participated um, in, those, uh, in those sessions. So it was a series of four sessions over the summer and uh, I taught dialectical skills, um, dialectical behavioral therapy skills. I actually 
throughout my experience ended up becoming a trained therapist um, and um, taught those skills through narrative practice, narrative therapy, and also visual arts practice, visual therapy. And um, you know, the work I had been doing with uh, the Border Crossings projects, um, I'm so grateful for it because it got noticed, it got noticed by other agencies and, you know, everyone's like, can you talk about this? Can you come speak and give a, you know, a lecture on this? And can you write a book now? And so, I've, you know, so things have just really been booming for me. And I've, I've got a, a book forthcoming in, in the new year, well, more so towards 2023, specifically on using art pra practice. Um, I'm writing a self-help book um, specifically for uh, black identified individuals and indigenous identified individuals using art practices to help facilitate an experience of transformation and healing. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm just really passing on the tools that have been given to me and the platform that's been given to me over the past couple of years in my own healing journey. So despite the challenges, the silent battles I've been fighting, um, you know, as a politician, you know, having those special needs as well, having to take care of my, my mental health and as a community leader, having to, you know, fight that, you know, hard balancing act sometimes of just caring for self and caring for community. Um, it's just been such a wild ride, but also such a blessing. And so I have to say that despite all the challenges, the, the pitfalls I've had, but also the, the risings have been all a, contributing factor to where I am today and, and to the work I do today. So thank you so much, Border Crossings. I'm so glad to be here. Yes. Oh, wow. That was, that was incredible. I feel like uh, tearing off my shirt and uh, just taking over the world after this. That was literally like, I'm like, yes, right? Like, how, that made me feel so, like, so empowered. And like, one of the things that really stood out to me was how you spoke about um, t uh, taking care of self and then taking care of the community. And like that, to me, really, resonated because a lot of times people think that if they lean on the community enough that it will heal themselves, but it's such a reflective and a connected uh, way in which of a relationship that's being built back and forth in that way. And I feel like each and every, all, all of the people, up, uh, like you guys have all spoken on um, being able to impact the people around you and to be able to hold spaces, uh, brave spaces, sacred spaces, um, to be able to connect to that and to be able to like see each and every one of you have that. It, it really came um, to a sense of self, I think. Um, you know, uh, I, I really appreciated how you spoke about, um, to an extent, you guys had shared a little bit about this, but I'd love to, like, hear, do you guys have, like, a moment where you realized that, like, art was for you, you know, like, an origin story of sorts, you know, like, we were talking a little bit earlier about, like, um, you know, superheroes and what, but, like, I think all artists have, like, an origin story where they realize, like, this is for me, this is what I want to be doing, uh, so I'd love to put it out, uh, whoever would like to start, um, I would love to hear your origin story if you have one, um, and it's definitely something that um, directly connected with like um, how you came to be the artist that you are today, as well as the, the educators that you are are today. Sure. Um, I actually music was not my original plan for a career. I was actually planning on medicine. Uh, when I was nine, I had two major surgeries back to back, which had me in Credit Valley Hospital for three months straight. And I have this memory of seeing, um, I won't get too graphic, but basically tissue, and it fascinated me. And I, basically from that point on, everything that I was studying was science related. Um, but I was also, by the lottery of birth, I, uh, I had parents that put me in lots of different things, lots of different sports, lots of different instruments. And I had been doing music as, as, a, as a pastime along the way. And my folks enrolled me in band camp. <laughs> and I have this memory of being at the National Music Camp of Canada when I was 16. Essentially what they did was they hired all of these heavy hitter players from around the province, mostly profs from U of T and from Humber from the jazz program. And I was 16, sitting with a bunch of my friends, and every night we got a concert, us, you know, from world-class musicians. And I remember in the middle of a Kirk McDonald solo, I had like a moment where everything just seemed to make sense. It was like I could have lived in that moment. And it, from that point on, my path very much steered towards music. And it, um, I spent most of my 20s uh, not playing the folk rock and rhythm and blues. I actually toured around playing in a death metal band for about 10 years. Um, so I was crisscrossing across the nation in the skeeziest venues you've ever seen. <laughs> and having the time of my life doing it. 
And um, that's how I really cut my teeth in the music industry. I basically learned it from the bottom up, from niche genres. And it very much came to serve me uh, in my 30s when I ended that project and wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do. And I was hosting some community events at the time and all of these ideas and songs and stories just started pouring out of me with an acoustic guitar in my hand. And I started playing them and got a very, very positive response to where and there's another gig and another gig. And it very quickly became um, my full-time pursuit in, in that genre. So band camp, that's my origin story. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was always an artist, I think. Just, I think probably a lot of us will say that. But the, what happened somewhere in the 70s or 80s, someone said, if you call yourself an artist, you're an artist. People will believe you. So that's what I did. And uh, so, so I was, uh, I'm an artist, um, but I'm more of, I guess, a craft, a craftivist. Well, a crafter, multi-craftual. And uh, I don't know if you could see, this is my favorite dress, and I was, uh, I'm still working on it. And one of the things, uh, a craftivist is, is, you're all craftivists, by the way, you are, is, is craft plus activism, and it's art plus activism. And um, Carol Ann was mentioning how, how she crocheted. And every time that you crochet or sew, or uh, knit or weave, you are a craftivist. You are saying that you are saying that you are a fast fashion rebel, and that you recognize that there's some ethical issues with um, the way fast fashion is is uh, put out there. And uh, the $5 t-shirt isn't just $5. And so where that all started to make sense to me, and in the early 2000s, um, the term craftivism came up. And so even though I always called myself an artist and was multi-craftual type of thing, doing a lot of things and teaching a lot of things and being pretty successful, I guess, like part-timey basis, it wasn't until um, I heard really the term craftivism, like in, in 2003 or something, and also uh, visible mending. And visible mending became a big deal to me when, when I start learning about the $5 t-shirt doesn't cost $5, and uh, what it's costing uh, workers, and what it's costing our environment and our water. And that, um, and also with visible mending, especially since when Emily uh, passed, um, I started a blog called Visible Mending that same month. And basically, it's as being somebody who uh, will talk about mental health issues. That that's a part of mending. You know, like to you know, you're, it's this organic thing that if you've got mental health issues. It's an organic thing. It's not something that ends or you get over type of thing. So that the craft and the art of uh, creating and mending really started to make sense like once, uh, once my daughter passed because it was visible mending is what I was doing, but also visible mending was what I was doing. So yeah. So. Basically, I've always known I was an artist, but it wasn't until I think craftivism and visible mending did I really solidify myself that way. Yeah. Ooh, there ain't no other way. <laughs> Baby, I was born this way. I actually, my, my parents, I was a stage kid growing up. I don't know if anyone ever, like, my parents put me into like every musical, every audition, every class, every piano, a gymnast. I did everything. And I, I guess a lot of people wouldn't understand, like they didn't realize that this kid was 10% blind, 10% uh, you know, low vision and also a hard of hearing. And um, art actually was a way for me to express and to experience the world 
in a different way because I had no other way of processing the world sensorily, either through eyesight or through hearing. Um, and so expression through writing, through performance, through speaking, through acting, through singing, um, finding my own voice in my own way was sort of, um, that, that was my way of being. Being an artist is my mode, my true mode of being, I think. And I, 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 I find that it's still the truth even now. I mean, even though I've um, transitioned through several different types of careers, I've worked in banking and HR for so, I actually tried to work in HR in the bank for a while, you guys. Like, can you picture me in a corporate environment? Like, you know, no, I was like, I was a bad HR consultant, <laughs> but like, I'm, not, I'm a true creative, you know, and, um, you know, I, 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 I operate in a space of freedom, of a space without border, borders, without, you know, without boundaries, without um, barriers, and so reaching for different artistic practices or creative practices are just other ways for me to communicate and express with the world, so I had to say I was born this way. Like, I, there's no change in me. I, I, I actually there was a period in my life when you know before I was diagnosed. Um, this was like way before I had any idea like what was going on with me mentally. Um, before I even was you know, awakened to my neurodivergence and have w which has basically given birth to who I am today. And there was a period when I was working in banking and HR <laughs> for eight years. Um, I stopped singing, I stopped doing art, I stopped painting, I stopped acting, I stopped playing guitar, I play multiple instruments as well, and I stopped, I stopped it all, all of it. Um, and it was the most depressing part of my life. In my 20s, I was just like, there was no creativity whatsoever, none, none. I was just on the phone all day long, like just doing boring HR consult calls and employee relations and policy, and, which is important, it's, it's God value, and I, you know, I, mastered it for a point but you know it, it didn't bring me joy it didn't bring me freedom it didn't allow me to operate in those ways that were most natural to me and i'm just a natural born expressive individual and so i quit the bank <laughs> um you start my own business um, you know as an artistic entrepreneur started just consulting and and, and teaching from um, my gifts and um, and here I am today, and you know it's, it's really just how I was born. That's amazing. And uh, those socks are way too awesome to be in HR. That's all. I <laughs> <can say>. like, <laughs> literally, if anybody could see it, it's so powerful and awesome. And uh, I, I think that that's such a wonderful way for us to um, you know just close out kind of our our uh, panel here is to just really acknowledge like how much art brings to our lives, how much it contributes to either activism or our sense of well-being or our joy, um, our, our communities, like so much of that comes from art. And like being here on this panel with you today, I'm, I'm so honored to hear your stories. Um, and the last thing that I'll, I'll ask, um, just a quick, like, um, just uh, I would love for you to share, like if you were to have others remember you for your legacy, what is it that you would want them to remember you for? Uh, I love that, it's such an intense question, I know, but like, I think it's important because each and every one of you have shared such like the beautiful parts of your lives. But what would you like the world to, what would you like to leave the world with uh, in your legacy? I'm okay being worm food. <laughs> I, I think I just, I it doesn't matter to me. I'll just float off, and I'm okay not being remembered. It's more of, if anything, that I've learned during the pandemic is living in the moment. And uh, I've, you know, I've had to have a very good relationship with, uh, with death and with the other side and things like that, that I'm okay. I don't, it's okay, you don't have to remember me, but it's, it's what we're doing now for, that makes a sense to me. I, I also don't really think too much about being remembered. I'm more concerned with the, what the work that I'm doing is doing good. And if I were to be remembered for anything, it would be that. I'm like the complete opposite. I want to be remembered. Like, I want 
monuments and like <laughs> a clothing line and, and I'm, like, <laughs> but I'm just kidding. Well, not I'm half kidding, but yeah. not really. I, I I'd like to be remembered as an educator. I I want to be remembered as someone who left behind tools that people can use to help transform and change and teach themselves. Um, I can't physically be left behind or nothing of me will be left behind or maybe my spirit will still be here, I don't know, whatever you believe. Um, but if I can leave something tangible behind for my community or for people who are like me and have had similar experiences and stories and journeys like me, it would have to just be leaving behind artistic technology, leaving behind creative technologies, um, essentially creative applied wisdom so that people can use it for themselves and appropriate it for themselves so that they can experience the same coming into their own voice. There's the same sense of integration, and the same sense of community that I've experienced in my life. Um, from the people who've been a part of my healing community. So if that's what I want to, if I, if I am to accomplish one thing on this earth, it's to leave behind teaching tools, leave behind creative tools to help people continue that tradition of healing by art, healing by the creative process. Remember me. Thank you.